I need people now to please show me your, now turn on your video and show me your, um, your smartphone. You're going to do face app as part of, let's start with an activity. I need to turn on your video and download face app and um, we're going to do something on face app. Yeah. So you know what face app is? F-A-C-E-A-P-P, -P, right? Right, we're going to start with this activity and move into our... Is there anybody still stuck in the... Oh yeah, there's still two people inside the waiting room. Let's get them in. Okay, people are coming in. Right, right. Okay, so if you are just... you just come in, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, we are now uh, going to start with an activity before we go into the lecture proper. And uh, we'll do face app on your smartphone. So if you can... Take your smartphone out and um, download if you don't have face app, F-A-C-E-A-P-P. -P. I'm going to type it in the chat. If you already have that, uh, could you log in and take a shot of yourself first? We're going to do this together. So take a shot of yourself on face app. If there's anybody lost, please raise your hand so I can see or raise your electronic hand so I can see. Right? We are now on face app on the phone, if there's anyone lost. Okay, Amanda just came in. Amanda is coming in. All right, hello, Amanda. Let's see, we have uh, one, two, three, 12, 13, 14, 15 of us now. How many do we have now? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, okay, three, four. We have 20 of us right now. That's right. So once again, if you are in already, could you turn on uh, your, take your smartphone out, download Face app if you haven't downloaded it already. And uh, I think you need to log in with some email or password. And then go ahead to take a shot first. And we're going to see what we're going to do with the photo you will take. Right. Okay, Amanda is trying to come in, uh, but she's uh, having some problems. I see the word joining. Yeah. So if you are done already, if you are done using FaceApp to take your initial shot, could you just show, show everybody here? Let's show, I'm going to show you mine. Oops, oh, I, I've done it too fast. Um, let me do it again. Okay. So you know how to do that, right? Take a photo and that's about it. Okay. So this is me on face app. Could I have everybody do this? Show your, show your photo on your screen, on your camera. So I can see you. If you're using the phone also for zoom, then you can. Of course, but if you're using a computer, could you do this now? Yeah. So do this and I know you're done. Take a photo on face app. That's right. Take your normal photo. Okay. Um, Mesavi is done. Ifana is done. Natalie is done. Uh, Lin is done. Liang Min is done. Shemin is done. Uh, Alistair is done. Grace is done. Uh, Joyce is done. Phoebe, are you done? You're facing the other side. Yue Ling is done. Phoebe is done. Shamin is done, okay. Uh, 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 if you're just coming, we're on Face app. Thank you, Grace is done. Okay, Shuying is done. Rachel, are you done? I think I haven't called you yet. Okay, uh, Lukman is done, right? Lukman, you're done. Okay, I haven't called Rachel yet. Let's wait for her. Ah, Rachel is done, excellent. All right, uh, let's see who else. Tingyi, are you uh, on Face app already? If you are, could you uh, show your, your form? We're going to move on to the next step. And then Shamin, is that Shamin? S-H-A-M-0016 at e in the, uh, Who is that actually? Shamira, is that right? I, I, I think, I, I need to see your name. Yeah, if you can change your profile to your name. I can see everybody's name. Okay, anybody is stuck or don't know how to uh, navigate this? All right. Jingyi, are you okay? Jingyi, calling. Yep, I see Rachel. Yep, thank you. Yep, Jingyi. 
Okay, we'll come back to Ting Yu. Everybody remind me. All right. Um, uh, she's, she's done doing it already, but she's using Zoom on her phone. Oh, on the phone. I see. I see. Okay. Oh, is she? Is she? Oh, okay. Sorry. Ting Yu wrote something on the chat. Okay, I've just seen it. Thank you. All right. No problem. Okay. We are now going to edit this short. Huh? How we're going to do it is this. We're going to scroll to um, H. No prizes for getting it right. We are going to old. Right? We are going to look at old. So edit your own photo using old. Right? Try to save it. You, if you are interested, you could try the cool old. I think there is another feature called cool old. And then I don't know, some hair would stomach or some beard or some, I don't know, something would come out from there. Right? Okay, now save, if you have, you have done two, that's fine, one old, one cool, or save bo both of them. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, when you do that, you get an option um, of a before and after, right? Anybody doesn't have that, you have a before and after. Okay. So, um, save your before and after, so you need to click on that before and after, I mean, type, um, touch on the before and after and save that. So now that photo before and after is saved on your phone. So for me, with a cool uh, old, it looks like that. That's mine, right? Okay, what we're gonna do is, with your before and after shot on FaceApp, everybody following? Okay, yes, following? If you're not following, type uh, slow down on the chat. So I will slow down. No slowdown, okay, good. Everyone's following, good. All right, so what we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you to use the photo on your phone and put that on our NTU Learn discussion forum, which I've just created. So use your phone, you could uh, actually go on to learn, NTU Learn using your phone. Um, yep. Give you a two minutes to do that. Log in to NTU Learn using your phone. If you don't know how to do that, it is simply ntulearn.ntu.edu.sg. Or you can Google and you can find that as well. So it's NTU Learn. Right? If you type NTU Learn, you will come on Google, you'll see ntulearn.ntu.edu.sg. Right, so log in to NTU Learn on your phone because your photo is on your phone, right? Okay, is everybody okay with that? Then on that discussion forum, and I'm gonna share my screen on the discussion forum uh, that uh, I created. It's called Informal Caregiving Week 8. And then there is another, there's a forum or thread called When I'm Old. If, see if you can navigate to that one. I'm going to also share my screen so you could see. All right, share screen. Uh, here we go. Okay, did I share the wrong one? I think I shared the wrong one. Hang on a minute. Am I sharing the right one? Nope. Can you see my, my, my uh, NTU learn? Uh, yeah, yeah. You can see my NTU learn? Great. Okay. So here we are at uh, discussion board, forum, wicked, informal caregiving. And then the thread is called when I am old. Click on that first thread that I started, or the first entry that I started. I'd like you to, re I mean, all of us can just reply either to me or to the person before you. When you reply, you actually get a message box with, on this far right, huh, you could see a plus sign, yes? This is where you upload your photo, insert local file. What we are gonna do is we're gonna look at everybody's photos. All of us are gonna look at all of our own before and after photo. And uh, in your own mind, if you're the owner, I mean, you're the person who took your own photo, give yourself the, uh, give yourself an age that uh, FaceApp gave you. So if you chose cool old or old, 
what do you think that age is, right? Give yourself that age. And then all of us are going to kind of think about how old you are as well. So let's upload that first. Questions, questions. Yeah, unmute yourself and ask me if you are not uh, if you are not uh, clear on what we are doing. I'm not looking at the chat now. Okay, I'll try to. Look at, okay, Tingy is uh, trying to come in. Okay, let's hope she gets in. Okay, I'm gonna temporarily stop my share so I could look at the chat. Um, okay, nobody put anything there. Uh, okay. Give us a few minutes to do all that. Yes. All right. Oh, Sham. Oh, Sham. Okay. You're also using your phone for Zoom. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. About 10 of us have uh, posted already. I can see that. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have posted already, ready, uh, decide for yourself your aftershot. How old that is? I'm going to ask you later, right? Decide an age. Look at your own aftershot and ask yourself, how old is that of me, of yourself? How old is that? Okay, about 16 of us uh, uh, went into already. Let's have a look at what we have so far. Okay, I'm going to... Okay, uh, hang on. <laughs> Some of you aren't... Okay, quite a number of you aren't doing it right. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, let's see who got it right. Trisha is the first one who got it right. Afana is the one who got it second right. And then Grace is the third who got it right. When I say got it right, I mean navigating it. Now, do not do attachment. All of you have done attachment, I cannot see. <laughs> I cannot see your photo. I have to click in. That isn't good. We want to have one page of photos all, all over. right? So this is why I gave you specific instruction. Use the add content plus sign, not the attachment. So once again, I'm going to demo this. I'm going to demo this by share screen. Share screen. Uh, all right. Share screen right now. Okay. The screen is shared. Now you can see this, right? What these people who have done correctly uh, is that you see, you can see that the photo appears right there, all right? Right here, like that. Okay. So Trisha got it, right? Rafana got that, right? Oh, that's a very nice one. Okay. Grace got that, right? Okay. Now, so how do we do this? Essentially, uh, go to anybody's post right now, click on reply, click on reply. You will see a message box, right? Once again, on this message box, there are two, two rows of a toolbar. On the far right hand, you have this thing here, the plus sign, the plus sign. Click on the plus sign. Then only you insert your local file. Right. Once again, go to reply, reply anybody's post, right? Anybody's post. And then you come to a message box like this. I know what you guys are doing. I mean, you go to browse local file and just, right, attach. That's what we usually do, but I don't know. I'm, I'm actually surprised that few of you are, are noticed how to use the stool bus. <laughs> uh, I mean, you've been NTU for three years. I, uh, I haven't, uh, I think I only started uh, teaching this for one semester. Um, okay. So uh, there are many features on uh, learn, uh, learn NTU uh, discussion board actually, but let's um, try using this add content and then insert local file. Let's try to do that for those of us who, who couldn't do that. So if you've done once, you can do it again, or you can delete what you did just now and, 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 and do it again. Uh, you know, or you can just add on and forget about what you did just now, just leave, leave that message there. That's fine, fine with me too, you know. Um, so I'm going to refresh the discussion board and let's see uh, how many of us got that right. Ah, yes, Natalie got that right. Okay, wow. That looks like, uh, doesn't look like you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, excellent. Valerie got that right. 
Okay, Shermaine got that right. Excellent, I like that one. Uh, Alistair got that right. Wow, is that Alistair's dad or something? Okay, next. Um, okay, Phoebe got that right. Excellent. Yes. Uh, some of you, if after today's class, you want to show your dad or mom's your photos, you could and say, look, you know, in years time, I will look like that. Um, you know, or this is something you could look forward to, you know, in terms of how your dad or mom might look like. Just a guess. You yeah, got that right. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Grace, yes, you got it right earlier already. Shi Ying, yes, you got that right. Excellent. Wow, just excellent how they can do the white pair there. And then Crystal got that right. Joyce got that right. Jing Yu, okay. Jing Yu say 70 plus. Okay. So, okay. Each, I, let's see if any of you wrote some age. Each of you says, some of you say 70 plus. Okay. Valerie say 62. Uh, uh, let's see. Celine says, okay. Celine, how old do you think you are on that? You can just shout out your name. 66. 66? 56. 56. Okay, thank you. Okay, Sherman. How old do you think you are, Sherman? Uh, 70. 70, thank you. Uh, okay, how about Alistair? How old are you on that one? The old one. Did we lose him? Oops. Alistair. Okay, okay. I'm coming back to Alistair later. Phoebe, how old do you think you are on this one? Um, 70s. 70, okay, thank you. Uh, oh yeah, you wrote 70, all right. And uh, Tricia says late 60s. Okay, uh, let's see, Irfana, 60 plus. Okay, Irfana, can I ask you, is it more the late or the early? Uh, early. Early, maybe yeah. 63, 62 like that, right? Okay, thank you. Yelling says 70. Okay, let's see. Gray says 60. Mm. I see, 60. 60 plus, Lin. Okay, is it the lower up end or the upper end, Lin? Uh, upper end, yeah. Upper end, upper end huh? okay, okay. Move on a bit more. Shi Ying says how old. Okay, Shi Ying, how old do you think this is? 70s. 70s. Okay, in the middle, the lower or the upper end? Middle to upper. Middle, 75 to 79. Okay, sure. And Hui Min says 65 to 70. Joy says 80. 80, really? Wow, you, are, you top the charts right now. You're the only one. <laughs> okay, okay. And Jing Yu says 70. Uh, can I open that? Oh, I have to download that. Okay, oops. Okay, then I will not open that for now. Okay, now remember your age, huh? the, the age that FaceApp gave you. All right, remember that age, whether 65 or 70 or 72 or 75. Now, what we're going to do is, uh, let me, uh, we're going to um, go to this uh, place called, we're going to start, um, okay, let me, let me get the, turn off the share screen. Oh, Tingyi is trying to come in again. Okay. I'm going to turn off the share screen. Okay. Hopefully, Tingyi is able to join us. Uh, Lukman, are you able to join us? I just saw you just moved in. Yes. Uh, I submitted my photo. So, oh, but I think okay, it's, just, okay. it's, not, it's just not refreshed or something. Yeah, I haven't refreshed it. Yep, yeah. Yep. It's cool. Sure, Never mind. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Sure. No worries. Okay. Okay. I hope all those uh, who are coming in have come in. Let me just check. Anyone is in the waiting room still? No. Excellent. Okay. Remember that age. Because we are now uh, in the midst of our lecture, we are going to go into this thing called advanced care planning. And you want to remember that age that FaceApp gave you. Um, it's okay. Maybe I should just show the part of uh, the, the slides here. Um, okay, let me show the slides. Okay, 
just a moment. Okay. Maybe we'll do this first. Huh? All right. Remember that age, right? Um, with that age that FaceApp gave you, like, uh, like me, maybe let us have a show of hands. Huh? How many of you think that at that age, huh, you will need somebody to care for you? Just, just raise your hand or electronic hand. At that age, whatever age that FaceApp gave you. Let's see how many. I see one, two, three hands, four hands, look, man, five, six, all right, seven. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Seven or eight so, or a third of us. Okay. How many of you uh, believe that you need probably until about 90, 90, 90 years old before you need some care? So if you think that you need care when you hit about 90 or, or, or above and above, hands up. Let's see how many. 90 and above, you need care. I see one hand. Uh, yeah, I see two, uh, two, three. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Um, these, um, remember the responses about a third of us kind of thing by 70, we need care. You know, that means by 70, 70 plus, or, you know, whatever age that face that gave us, uh, the two thirds of us think that we may not, we still might not need care. Hold on to that thought. When we talk about advanced care planning, um, that's where we will visit this again. Okay, I'm going to share the slides right now. Um, I'm going to go into the lecture and then we are going to talk about uh, advanced care planning as one of those interventions um, that informal caregivers uh, actually could do with their loved ones. Let me share the slides. Anybody trying to come in? Uh, Tingyi say internet having issues. Tingyi, are you in already? Uh, yes, I see you, right? Tingyi, if you can uh, either show your face or, or speak something, say something so I you know, know you are here. Uh, I, I have admitted you already. Okay, uh, all right. Okay, because we are now doing online uh, online lectures, so every uh, try to stay awake. In fact, I must try to stay awake. I, I tend to uh, uh, you know uh, go into some other mode uh, because online isn't just just isn't good for me. So uh, every five to ten minutes, I'm going to remind myself to ask if you are catching and uh, and check whether I am uh, also catching you. All right. So now let me share the slides which you already have. I haven't made almost any uh, change uh, since I uploaded a version 0 0.9 yesterday. So I think those are fairly good to go. All right. So tell me if you tell me you can see my slides. Uh, now going to all right. Can I do the slideshow? Okay, excellent. Right. Uh, all right. Can people uh, see my slideshow? Yes. Do a thumbs up if you say if you say yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Slideshow. Good. Thank you. I'll move on now. Okay. Um. Okay. I hope this doesn't hang. I don't want to get famous for having a hang two hour session and uh, thereafter realizing I have to run the whole session again. All right. Um. Yeah. Some of you are smiling. You know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so that's the outline. Um, essentially, I will focus on the trends, the demographic trends, and then we'll go into the individual aspect, right? And thereafter, we'll go into the more um, sort of um, macro aspects, that means the policy aspects. Policy has two types, or at least two indicators of policy we'll look at, the public health outcome indicators, as well as the long-term care service use or service utilization indicators. Oh, in fact, we have a third one. We talk about cost and, and opportunity cost of informal care as well. And then if we have time, number four, right, uh, look at US, OECD, and even Singapore caregiving policies for today. Right, I'll reserve the last one hour to talk about your proposals. Right, So uh, then you can ask me questions and we can have some back and forth in the breakout groups. Okay. Who are our informal caregivers? That's the first question. Now, um, okay, I hear something. Somebody's coming. 
Uh, okay, good. <laughs> All right. All right. Who are informal caregivers? Our informal caregivers are, uh, are, are thought to be family members, friends, relatives, uh, and among family members, uh, spouses, daughters, sons, right, of usually a senior. Of course, this word caregiver is used quite loosely because if you think about it, child care, right, that care or caretaking is also caregiving, right? But here, our context of caregiving is, uh, our context of caregiving is really the care, the giving of care to an older person, right? So when we say formal care, right, terminology, formal care refers to pay. That means healthcare workers. That's formal care. That means community hospital, dementia care, day rehab center. Um, of course, our acute hospitals, um, occupational therapists, clinical psychologists, doctors, nurses, social workers, all these are formal care professionals. But right? informal care are people who aren't really paid and aren't really recognized uh, professionally for their time and efforts, regardless of the level of skills they have. Right, so that's that. Um, who, when we say lifespan perspective, you know already, uh, we covered this in lecture one and several lectures earlier. Uh, uh, we, as human beings, we need care when we are very young, and then we need care to, kind of towards the very tail end of our lives. Right, it's often in the, the middle, right, uh, the middle part, that means the adulthood part is when we give care. So chances are, if you're not a caregiver, then you are a care recipient. That is, uh, that is well, uh, roughly, rough, 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 roughly, roughly how we can imagine ourselves to be in, 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 a, in a lifespan. Okay, that's the, okay. Okay, can I, right, okay, let me move on. Uh, all right, this second slide, you have already seen it in lecture one, right? Uh, we, at this point, already know that Ericsson went beyond, right, in his uh, later days, went beyond the old, uh, his eighth stage into a ninth stage. In fact, I think two of you wrote this in your journal entry number one, right? That Ericsson went beyond, uh, in his psychosocial uh, uh, stages, went beyond uh, stage number eight, which is called old. Um, here, we, what we want to know is that uh, when we say who is our caregiver, what is the identity of the caregiver, we see that, well, these are our caregivers, they could be young, old, middle old, or sorry, they could be young adults, middle adults, mi middle aged adults, or the young old adults, taking, and taking care of the older old. So um, our caregivers, if you look at, say, identity changes, right, the, the young adults and the middle adults essentially are usually the children or the spouse of the older person. So they give care to an older person, right? But if it's a young old person, young old maybe 70s, you know, taking care of a 90s or 60s, taking care of 80s or 90s, then that could be the, that could still be the child, right? Or the spouse of the uh, person requiring care. In that situation, however, for young old to take care of old old, we may have the peers, i.e. friends. Oops. Uh, just checking. Uh, you could still hear me? Yes? Am I good? Are we good? Okay, we got something just... Uh, all right, moved on. Could you still see the slides? Are the slides still there? Still good? Okay. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Um, that means only I lost the slides. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Uh, let me get to my slides. Mm. Okay. All right. You can see the slides, yeah? Okay. Then we can move on from there. Um, Prof, you're not in full presentation mode. Oh. For your slides. Oh, okay. Hang on a minute. My screen share is paused. It says, oh, thanks. So hang on, uh, let me stop the share and resume the share. Okay, how about now? Am I okay? Am I, are you looking at the slide or looking at the non-presentation? Non-presentation. Non-presentation, okay. That means I have to stop the share again. Thank you for letting me know. Stop the share again. Present my slide. 
And now I will start the share. Okay. On screen number two, share. Okay, now you will see that, right? Excellent. Yeah, all good? Yes? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay, so anytime if something like that happens, please uh, just let me know. Just unmute yourself so uh, everyone can benefit from that. Um, okay, so this is about who is the caregiver. Um, when we say who, we not just look at identity, we look at the approach. So young old tend to use a certain approach, right? We call it then the, tri the trial and error caregiving approach. That means you don't really know much, you don't really know how to manipulate a wheelchair, never mind. I, I try once, I try twice, by the third time I know how to do it, for example. I don't really know how to talk to my uh, granddad or my grandma about her health condition, but never mind. I uh, kind of just uh, uh, sit with her or him and listen to what he has to say and then take it from there. So that's sort of like the trial and error, right? To middle adults tend to say, look, I want to know exactly what I need to do. I want to learn uh, what I need to learn and then I'll get it done. Young old, when taking care of older old, well, kind of uh, will not be so uh, focused on what needs to be done and skills, but uh, more thinking about, uh, could I still have a good relationship with this, my husband or my wife, right? So that, that is what we talk about as moral character development, right? Could I still have, um, could I still talk with him the same way as we used to talk? Right? on the same things, on that kind of thing. So this is one slide um, that really is, is worthy. I mean, it summarizes a lot of who the caregiver is, right, in terms of the life uh, milestones. Okay. Okay, move on. Oh, oops. This, okay, care caregiving is, Okay, this is from the US, once again, CDC, um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the US, right? How many caregivers? What is the proportion? It's about 20%. 58% um, are women, 20% are 65 and older in the US. Nearly 10% provide care to a dementia person. So that's uh, something to think about. Um, caregiving can be lengthy and intense, lengthy in that half have provided care for at least two years. It could be intense because 30% have provided care for at least 20 hours per week. So think about it, that's almost a part-time job, right? If it's 44 hours for a full-time job. Now, how about Singapore? According to the informal, the survey on informal caregiving, right? We, it is no surprise that females are the ones who take care of our older folks, right? 65% of them are married females. 55% of our caregivers in Singapore belong to that age group, 45 to 59. 49% hire foreign domestic workers. What about half do? Now this is data from 10 years ago. It was, the survey was conducted in 2010. It remains authoritative. It remains the only widespread, white, uh, you can say authoritative household survey of informal caregivers in Singapore. Uh, we know that after that, SMU conducted another survey on dementia caregivers, 5,000 over participants. Still, we haven't had a next informal caregiving survey in Singapore done yet. So that remains authoritative, right? 65% um, of our caregivers live in one to two room HDB flats then in 2010 and perceive right, inadequate finances to provide caregiving. Females tend to, female caregivers tend to focus on the activities of daily living. That means toileting, transferring from bed to bench, uh, and so on, right? Whereas males tend to focus on, if they are caregivers, tend to focus on instrumental activities of daily living. That means uh, whether one could cook, right? So in order to cook, you need at least two to, you need to be able to do two things. You need to be able to stand and need to be able to manipulate your arms, right? 
and you know perhaps have strong enough to carry some weight the walk or the you know the bow or something like that you need some manual dexterity to cut you know use a knife right, for instance so those are what we call instrumental activities of daily living limit daily living so different things are like adls are activities of daily living iadls are instrumental activities of daily intru, instrumental activities of daily living okay give me a thumbs up if you're still following everybody still following Yes, electronic thumbs up is fine too. Yes, anybody have any questions? No, no questions so far. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Let's move on. Okay, right. Um, trends in formal caregiving, variations in caregiving experiences uh, happen uh, according to these uh, kind of six uh, areas, right? If you are a younger person to give care, young adult giving care, the experience is going to be quite different if you, than if you are, say, a young old, 70, right? For obvious reasons. As I said earlier, between a gender or between the two sexes, the female caregivers tend to experience or give care or more the activities of daily living limitations, whereas the males tend to uh, care, uh, kind of focus more on the instrumental or more the practical aspects, not the very basic like toileting, cleaning after the bowel movements, right? The meaning of care and the consequences of performing the caregiver role or carer role is also different between male and female, right? Um, for females, uh, more extensive, uh, females tend to have kind of compared with males, right? Uh, uh, according to research, more extensive social network. So they often rely on their social network for you know, stress relief, um, whereas males tend to kind of uh, use kind of a task oriented or managerial approach in order to gain control and, and in order to kind of make choices or help the senior person at home, right, make choices. So that is kind of one, one kind of difference, one type of difference or one kind of variation due to gender. Of course, there are other variations. Eth different ethnic groups have slightly different ways of, of uh, giving care. Right. Depending on the living arrangements, for instance, right, uh, how to give care in a one-room place is going to be different. If it's uh, going to be in a four-room or five-room uh, flat or a bigger house, a landed property, um, you know, it's, it's just going to be different. So we are. So the point here is, caregiving experiences are varied. Um, when we say caregiving, we also ask ourselves when and what. When do we start becoming a caregiver? Right? We often become a caregiver when our loved ones, the senior, uh, fell down or starts to experience some chronic illness. So every illness will have a trajectory. Right? Uh, so this, uh, our caregiving journey or trajectory often kind of coincides with the journey or the trajectory of the patient. So for instance, if the person is a stroke patient, Stroke, we know that, you know, uh, needs immediate hospital care and then stabilization. And then thereafter planning for discharge into the community. And once discharged, we know that the patient needs to have a regular rehabilitation and follow up at some stroke care unit, outpatient or community rehabilitation. And then the patient also needs to adapt to new way of life, i.e. person cannot move around as though he or she was totally independent. There will be loss in certain dexterity. Uh, there will be loss in certain strength on certain parts of the body due to stroke. So caregiving kind of tends to follow that in, in, with certain illnesses, right? Uh, for instance, in the acute phase, in the stroke patient's journey, then the caregiver tends to be basically visiting the ward. Medical stabilization in the ward, then that's where the caregivers right, could kind of take a break by the time uh, discharge planning is being done, the caregiver is involved in the discussion and arrangement, discussion with the health professionals in hospital and arrangement of the uh, house facilities as well as uh, family, um, uh, family coordination. I mean, could, uh, the, the caregiver will have to think about whether dad or mom could still sleep in the same bed he used to sleep in, for instance. Whether dad or mom could, well, walk up Walk, enter the house via the main gate, the main door, because uh, perhaps the main gate and main door, well, this is a phenomenon in Singapore. We often have those two steps, right? right? Before your HDB flat, before you open your door, 
a, a phenomenon that not every other place have in, in the world, but our flats have this feature. So then do we need to book a, a build a ramp, right? Wheelchair in, wheelchair out, for instance. Is the house uh, spacious enough? Are there handrails, grab poles uh, at the toilets, at the kitchen, for instance? So the caregiver needs to think about all these as part of discharge before the patient could even be discharged. And then thereafter, when say a stroke patient moves back into home to stay, then the caregiver needs to think about the scheduling, right? Is it a Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of a day rehabilitation? Uh, is it Tuesday, Thursday, you know, how to go there? Are we going to book a cab? Uh, are we going to get a center to, to, to get a van? And then if the van comes, right, how am I going to get my dad or mom out from the house to the van? And then from the van, if there is a van uh, driven by the center, then the van will take care of the journey there. But after that, right, we have to also make sure some centers may not have the manpower to actually take the person from the ambulance or van to, right up to the doorstep of the center. So sometimes caregivers take that role, right? So there are many details here. So the, all the tasks and roles vary, right? According, sometimes, often according to the uh, nature of the illness and the trajectory of each illness. Uh, and then therefore what the caregiver does also changes, right? From visiting the hospital, bringing food there to making care decisions, to making sure the house is physically ready. All these things uh, differ according to the trajectory. So here is a continuum from awareness, unfolding responsibility to increasing care demands, right? If unfortunately this elderly or senior person is approaching end of life, then that's end of life care, right? All these will have different tasks. We could see those, right? Looking at the sample caregiver task or CG task, right? You could see uh, what I've just this, uh, kind of described verbally, right? Um, often caregivers ask themselves, uh, when will this finish? Yes, so, so my dad has cancer, so he is suffering, so he has a terminal illness, so his days are numbered. You know, often caregivers ask themselves, on the one hand, when will this finish? On the other hand, am I being unfilial? Am I being cruel to even ask this question? Caregiving finishes at bereavement, as you can tell, right? There's a blank box there, literally, uh, instrumentally speaking. But bereavement is yet another phase in a, in a caregiver or a former caregiver's journey. Okay, what family caregivers do for older adults? Really long, long laundry list here. You could read, I, I, I won't read them for you. Um, um, I, could, I just want to point out that there are different uh, categories of tasks. So we, when we say caregiving or caregiver, we, let's not try to imagine they're a homogeneous group. They're really a varied, varied group. Who, what, when, right? it's a very varied. Right. Even, uh, even within, among, say, caregivers of a certain illness, patients with certain illness, like caregivers of stroke patients, even those are very, very good. So we are really talking about um, heterogeneity here. This chart shows a percentage of caregivers who help every day on most days during the past month right, by type of help in 2011. So for instance, uh, caregivers who help with chores, as in household chores, about 44.1% right? uh, of these caregivers do that, help with these household chores. Driving the care recipient or CR to different places, run errands or to medical or to some other place, social uh, functions, 23.8% of caregivers do that. So you can see that these are the four main groups of uh, tasks or roles that caregivers are involved with. Type and frequency, um, right? Um, when one has dementia, as you know from lecture three, when one has Alzheimer's disease, dementia or vascular dementia, um, the intensity of care just increases. It's, 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 just, it's just mind blowing, right? Uh, because uh, no longer could the caregiver reliably uh, depend on the patient's uh, verbalized wishes because the patient may not be cognitively able to verbalize accurately what he or she needs or wants. Um, so the caregiver actually had to go beyond that and infer and think clearly. And that essentially requires time, energy, and it's almost like a, a full-time job, less, less of a full-time salary. Um, 
So that's essentially what this chart is showing. It's compare kind of four situations, dementia only cases, no dementia, but two or more cell care needs. Dementia uh, and have two or more cell care needs. And finally, no dementia having less than two self care needs, right? Um, yep, you could see from there, um, for instance, uh, the first row there with chores, you see dementia only is 44.6. How often do you help with chores? Dementia only 44.6, right? On the far end, how often do you help with chores on the far right hand side? It's no dementia and less than two self care needs is 38.7. So it's a fair bit of difference. Another one we could think about is, um, right, the second one, with self-care. Look at that with self-care. With dementia only, the caregiver will respond to the question, how often do you help with self-care, right? How many days, right? On average, caregivers spend 10.5 days a month, right? On helping with self-care of the patient. Or with dementia only. But that increases to 42.0 if you look at the third column from the left. Dementia plus two or more self care needs. It's quite a big difference, isn't it? Dementia only versus dementia with two or more self care needs. Often we say, yeah, in those kind of situations in the third column, dementia plus two or more self care needs, right? Uh, we, we, we need a, a, a third person, often a domestic helper. But increasingly, even today, we say that, look, even if it's just the first column, the dementia only, right? Or perhaps even the last column, no dementia and less than two cell care needs. Even those uh, cases or those uh, seniors, we, we start to see now families employing domestic workers to take care, right? Okay. Care recipients, dementia status. All right, this is a continuation of the previous chart, essentially. Right, it shows emotional, physical, and other difficulties. Okay, we ask ourselves also when, sorry, where, where does caregiving occur? Uh, caregiving occurs obviously in the house, informal caregiving, of course, informal, right? But it's not just in the house, right? Um, going to facilities in the hospital like SOC or specialist outpatient clin clinics, right? that is bringing there, staying or escorting and then bringing back. So today we have escorts, medical escorts. You pay for a service, either by hour or by part day or by full day. Right? In the yesteryears, we don't. So family members take charge of that or relatives. Center-based care is where the senior goes to a certain center and stay there for almost a whole day from say 9.30 to maybe 4.30 in the afternoon and then comes back. So sometimes caregivers actually stay with the senior over there. Sometimes caregivers go there, bring the person there, and then goes out for some work. And then during lunch visits, and then after lunch, uh, goes back to work. And then at 4.30 or 5, goes back to the center to bring the senior home. Right? If, if, if proximity and other arrangements allow. We call all this aging in place because the in place means uh, the staying overnight of the senior is at home. The other one, the aging out of place, right? Not a very good word to use, is where you don't stay at home. The senior doesn't stay at home. So the caregivers end up visiting often the care facilities. So this is where COVID-19 makes a difference, right? If you think about it. Um, not only are seniors kind of right, isolated, I mean, in the nursing home, they're not allowed to, they, they only can have say one or two in a room. Not only that, but visiting is often not allowed in a pandemic. And if visiting is allowed, body contact, physical contact is not allowed, right? So you can see how, uh, how this limits, uh, on the one hand, the role of the caregiver. So in a way, you say it's good because then the person could, take, could be relieved. But that could also, on the other hand, increases the burden and makes the person feel, makes the caregiver feel um, he or she is, uh, is helpless. Uh, watching his or her loved ones at in the nursing home becoming frailer, weaker, perhaps even having an increased risk of contracting the illness, the infectious illness. Um, so that is often nursing homes and residential facilities are often taken as the last resort. Uh, caregivers often want to keep their seniors in place, right? And then if it's not possible for whatever reason, maybe complex medical needs or something about a family situation, then that's when they consider out of place.
right? How do caregivers give care? Well, you essentially need all these resources, time, money, skills. Um, we don't yet in Singapore have a professional accreditation for informal caregivers where we can say they, are, they, are, they belong to level one skill, level two skill. Um, we should have, in my opinion, um, we could actually redesign the workplace skills uh, qualifications framework, but how to get there, the, the devil is really in the details, right? So until today, in many places, uh, caregiving remains informal, unpaid, unrecognized, or undervalued. And uh, what we call domestic workers, who are supposed to be trained for household chores, are given an unfair burden of uh, or expectation of uh, caring for a senior, as if they are trained when they are often just either not trained or minimally exposed, I would say. Okay, um, that's. That's the part on informal caregiving. Um, any questions? I think I should pause here. Any questions? Everybody doing okay? Um, okay, why don't we take a quick five minute break uh, and come back at 4.30 and then we'll carry on the second part of the, the lecture. All right, five minute break. You know, anybody has questions, feel free to type in the chat.
Okay. I hope you are back. All right, if you're back, could you type on the chat back? So I know you're back. Okay, Celine's back, Preacher back, Rachel back, Celine back, Lukman back, Nelly back, Valerie, yep, Fana is back. Yeah, I can see some of you. Alistair is back. Crystal on. Yep. Sharon is back. Okay, Lynn is back. Okay, Yelling is back. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, by the way, Alistair, I, I was calling you just now and wanted to ask you. How old do you think you are on the on the old photo? Um, didn't get your answer on that. Do you have an answer? Oh, I, I think I went to the toilet. Uh, sure, sure. How old are you on the? How old do you think you are on the old photo? I think around like seventy. Around seventy. Uh, sure, around seventy. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. No, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um, still keep your, uh, let all of us keep your, the age, uh, keep the, I mean, remember the age that you believe FaceApp gave you. Okay, you are is back, excellent. We're going to move on to that now. Okay, um, as we go into the second part of the lecture, um, which, um, to inv let, which will involve this um, advanced care planning, I'd like you to look at your phone or look at the, the discussion forum again, look at your photo again. Your before and after photo, all of us, right? Just your, your, just your own photo will do, right? Stare for a few minutes of, okay, a few seconds on your old photo, right? Internalize that age. So right now, okay, we're gonna do an exercise. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna show a few questions. And then I'd like to ask, you know, the 60 year old you or the 75 year old you to answer that, okay? So look at your own photo first. Try to get into the, the, the mood, if you like, or the, the situation where you are now in an old age, right? So look at your own photo. Meanwhile, let me share the screen. Okay. Um, no, I won't share it that yet. Here's one of the questions that uh, we can have some response. So type a response to this question on the chat, right? Question is, what makes each day meaningful at that age? Okay, um, who is that? Okay, all right, I've just muted Phoebe. Hope you don't mind. Um, okay, right. So question is, I'm gonna type here, what makes each day meaningful to you? And what gives you, okay, what gives you life purpose? All right, two questions, right? You, everybody could see that in the chat, okay? Take a few moments to think about the answers to this and I'd like you to just type in the chat, will do your answers. It could be a few words, it could be one word or it could be one sentence or two. At that age, huh? not now, but at that age, so look, stare at your photo. If you, if you don't have an answer to that, you need to look longer at your photo, in your old photo. Just stare it for longer if you need to. Yeah, and type, type in uh, and we'll, we'll see what we have. Give everybody maybe you know, a couple of minutes to just type in. Starting to see some interesting answers. Yeah, if, if more than one thing come to your mind, sure, just type that in, no issue. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, from Joyce, the first one, quality time. And I see staying alive. I think you, Sharon says spending time with family. Natalie, spending time. Fana, spending time. Valerie, relationship, family, friends. Lynn says copy. Kosong. All right. It's a Lynn, spend time. Crystal, enjoy the food. Uh, Rachel, doing things I truly care about. 
um, Shermaine having time to learn, Trisha quality time, right? Building a life with my partner, Ting Yi, random things without bothering what, whether it's a waste of time or not. Mm, I have to think a bit about that. Okay, random things. I mm, I wonder what that is. Um, care to say? Care to elaborate? Really? If you are here, random things can mean many things. Um, can I say through the mic? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so random things like things that you want to do now at this age but you don't have the time to commit to it. Like for instance, like you want to go to the park to watch the birds. Just sit down there like six hours to mm -hmm. watch the birds. Wow. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Sure. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, Crystal says, Quality, friendships, Lukman, doing things I didn't have time. Okay, sort of what Lukman said, right? Didn't have time to do. Right? Same thing with you, Ling. Uh, quality time, relationships. Uh, Shuing says, spending quality time. Phoebe, staying mobile, being able to make an impact. Ying Xuan, doing meaningful things. Liang Min, doing things I enjoyed that I couldn't last time due to time. So, essentially, I can summarize everything with one word. The answer is time. Um, doing time, not being in prison, not doing that kind of time, but essentially doing things uh, with the time that you have, uh, assuming you have lots of time on hand. So I guess after two weeks ago's lecture, you realize that the age of 60 plus or 70 is retirement. So perhaps that is one uh, thought you had or assumption you had. So I'll have more time because I'm retired and only to work. Right? Um, the other one is that uh, you value quality time with uh, loved ones, family, um, friends, um, partners, spouses, right? So it does seem like uh, among the resources that you, you seem to want to either have or you believe you will have will be time, right? In, in, the, in, the, in older days. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. And that, um, that I, I, I believe is essentially what uh, we, we hear in the industry too, in, in people whom I, whom I see, whom I the caregivers whom I train and the seniors who, who come with them. It's essentially almost the same. Time with this person, time with that person, doing this with this person, doing this with that person, uh, or just doing this and just sitting there or just standing there. Yes, right, you're, you're not quite different. The challenge is this though, when we hit that age, right? The age that FaceApp gave you, 65, 70, 75, 90, um, do your caregivers, assuming you will have a caregiver, do your caregivers know what um, to do for you? Right? So that means would your caregivers know that you prefer to have quality, quality time with ch children, for instance, for Celine? For instance, for Lim Chen, doing meaningful things and exactly knowing exactly what those meaningful things are or will be, right? For Tricia, will your caregiver know whether quality time is what you prefer, what you value to have, what you value you will have, right? For Shemin, is learning more, so time to, to, to attend classes, to attend enrichment, for, for example. So we realize uh, because many of our wishes when we are in our older age may not uh, somehow be informed, right? But may not be known some, some, for some, for many reasons, may not be known to our caregivers, right? This is where this, uh, uh, this concept called advanced care plan um, uh, uh, mix, uh, mix, mix uh, is valuable, right? Um, let me quickly share this screen here. Screen number two. Um, you could actually find this on livingmatters.sg, right? Everybody can see my screen, right? This is a four steps to, simple step to ACP. You can see that, right? So ACP stands for Advanced Care Planning, right? You could get this from Living Matters. You can just Google it. Um, right. What is advanced care planning? It's essentially planning for our own aging, essentially. Right? Essentially, that's it. So that means actually anybody could do this. You don't have to wait until you're of that age. Right? If you do it right now, if you start writing this, and obviously this will change along the way, your care wishes. Right? Um, your caregivers at that point will understand you much better. So what is advanced care planning? 
sharing your personal values on the right side, right? values and belief, writing down your wishes and sharing your plan. So part of the plan will be medical, yes, but it's not just medical. There are many other areas, the social areas, personal preferences, even living arrangements, right? Um, who could be your voice? Anybody who you, whom you trust and whom you could uh, re essentially rely on to communicate accurately for you, essentially. Moving on, right? On the, on the left, it says there are only four steps. Think about, think about it. Think about what it means to live meaningfully. Number two, discuss with your loved ones. Number three, put your wishes in a plan, right? The main ones at least. And then four, review these preferences or plan as you go along, as you, as you grow older, as you age. And then inform your loved ones and important people on that. This is one thing that caregiver could do for their loved ones if their loved ones hadn't taken initiative to do this. Now, let me have a show of hands, either electronic hand or your, your hand, right? Raise your hand if any of your seniors at home had done some of this, any aspect of this with you. Like, talk to you about what is meaningful and what he or she wants to do. Anybody? Electronic hand? No electronic hand. Real hand? No, no, no real hand. Okay. Okay, let me turn the tables around. Now, let me ask you, raise your hand if you would like your future caregiver right, to know these things. What, what is important to you? What gives you meaning in life? What gives you purpose in life? Raise your hand if you, if you want your future caregiver to. Raise your hand, stay there. Let me just do a count. Either electronic hand or your real hand is fine. I just want to check. All right, okay. Right, thank you very much. I, almost everybody, thank you very much. Yes, exactly. So you can see, we have just demonstrated to ourselves what, a, what, what an interesting uh, phenomenon, right? Uh, we want our future caregivers to, to know this, but yet uh, at this moment, we uh, do not actually see our seniors uh, around us, near us, in our homes, uh, actually having communicated this. I mean, interesting. Now, I'd like to open up a, a short time. Unmute yourself uh, if you have something to share on this question. Could you say one or two reasons, you know, just off your head, off the top of your head, why our seniors today kind of do not, uh, do not seem to have communicated this in advance? Make your intelligent guess. You, you, there is, uh, you, you don't have to have the right answer. Anybody, just unmute yourself and talk. Make a quick guess. Yeah. Piety, like they trust their family members to make the decisions for them. Right, so trust family members, therefore I don't have to say anything. Okay, thank you. Other reason, anyone? Um, they feel like if they talk about it, it means that they might be going to die soon. Oh, so I talk about like some superstition. I will die soon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like a so superstition. I don't, soon, therefore I don't want to talk about it. Is yes. that so? thank you very much? Maybe it's because they feel like they're already a burden, so they don't want to add more, like to ask for so much. Right. So my son is already carrying the wheelchair, carrying me with my wheelchair every day. I, I better not give him more problems. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Yep. Any others? Any others? Any other reasons you could think of? Okay. Let me now. Sort of turn the question uh, around now. now. Now asking you as a caregiver, right? Let me ask you now as a caregiver or potential caregiver, right? Why, why or what do you think are some reasons that caregivers today, right? Caregivers today, family members, loved ones today, kind of do not take initiative or kind of do not open up and talk with their seniors or talk with their loved ones, the older loved ones on some of these um, questions or, or preferences or plan? What do you think are some reasons? Anybody? Just unmute yourself. Uh, I think cause like you just don't have time. You are just too busy with your own stuff. So you don't even want to initiate the conversation, I guess. Right. So after work, reach home, you're already kind of almost there. Like just want to lie down. Okay. Thank you. I think also cause uh, their perception of what the, the care recipient needs is is what they are mainly focusing on when they're planning how to care for the, for the care recipient. So 
their perception of like not having enough time because they they rather focus on the things that they think might be more important as compared to what the caregiver really wants. Uh, I, I kind of lost you on the, the last <laughs> sentence. Can you say that again? So like um, if like even though they may not they may think like they don't have enough time to think about um what the caregiver really wants or what they value. Um, it's probably because they pay like. I, I guess they do they put less importance on what what the care the care recipient wants right so i i, I can't prioritize so much what my father wants yeah okay. thank you Sally. thank you any other people it could also be that like it didn't cross their minds or they um like what she said um they think they know better what's better like what's best for their care recipient Right, so since I know better than my mom, than you, mom or dad, let me just decide for you. You know, okay? Possibly. Possibly. Um, I think that being vulnerable might be awkward for some family members. Like talking about wishes and talking about their feelings. I think, mm -hmm. especially. I, I like the word you use, awkward. Could you explain a little or elaborate a little? Like, what, 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 what do you mean by that? Um, I guess because it's not the norm to really share about your feelings mm -hmm. especially I think like if I were to ask my mom if she asked her mom um, about what she wanted before she passed I think it's a bit awkward I don't know what other word to use I think awkward is the best word because um, it's not normal for them yeah right not a norm to discuss this mm. sure now I, I think I think it's a very interesting point we could, we could all learn from um, basically the word awkward that you use <laughs> Um, um, first of all, um, anybody with uh, synonyms to help all of us understand what awkward in this context means. So Crystal obviously elaborated that, right? But the rest of us, type it into the chat if you can. So in this situation where, you know, it is what we, Crystal says, it's awkward to talk about plans and preferences, you know, so I don't. What Could you think of other words to replace awkward? What does that mean? So what are synonyms of awkward? Unfamiliar, Crystal, okay. Yes, uncomfortable. Yes, Celine says that. Yep. Yep. If, if somebody asks you, what do you mean by awkward? How would you, what is one or two words that you could quickly use to describe to him or her what, what you mean by? It's awkward to talk about this. Unable to share things. Yeah, yeah. Why is it unable? It's, it's awkward, right? Why, why is it awkward? Overstepping boundaries. Taboo. Okay, taboo. That means almost like uh, it is a no no, it's, 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 it's stigmatizing. It is. Okay. Difficult to initiate, um, uncomfortable, unable to share feelings and emotions. Um, yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's real. There is no right or wrong answer to, right, to my questions, as you can tell. Um, but um, yeah, but today there is the situation here. Um, we are quite disjointed. What, what our seniors may want may not be what the juniors are able to provide. What the seniors may want or need may not be what the juniors may want on uh, may want to provide or need to provide, right? Um, so you have uh, listed on the chat all the things that you would do in you know when you are older that gives you meaning and purpose in life, right? So I'm sure your seniors at home would have that, right? All our seniors at home would have what 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 is meaningful to him and what is purposeful to him or her. Thing is, do the juniors who kind of provide care no, and if they know, right, do they act on those? Do they prioritize those? If they don't, do they seek to find out? Right? After all, this is care, right? Right? This is, well, of course, there is also other aspects of the relationship, like father and son, father and daughter, and so on. But, but if you talk about just the role of care, right, often uh, it is it is an unfortunate phenomenon that yeah, we, uh, not just in Singapore, in many other places of the world as well, well, we're both in Western places as well as in Oriental places, and we fail to do this, communicate. So it is not just in the hospitals where say the doctors from this department are talking to doctor from that department, right? So you talk about care professionals not talking to each other, but it's also at home that our informal carers do not talk to the patient. So sometimes we complain uh, to the doctors that uh, my mom prefers this or that when the mom says it's okay in front of the doctor, right? To, to, to so-called an outside person. We, we, we like this. Um, 
So it is important. One of the things, one of the skills that caregivers, informal caregivers need to learn, or I believe should learn, is to actually open up a conversation, a two-way meaningful conversation between himself, herself, and the, being, the recipient or the person being cared for on these things. What living well means to me or to him or her. What is purposeful life? What is meaningful life? So this little booklet you can download from livingmatters.com um, essentially guides one on, on the things to, to, that one could talk about, right? Now, now think of just, I'm just quickly run through this, this thing with you. You can see uh, on the right side, relationship, lifestyle, religion, uh, and so on. Um, okay, move on. There's mental well-being, physical well-being, emotional well-being. You can still see, right? My screen share, right? Yes? Okay, excellent. Um, my care wishes... You know, that means if I have a serious illness, what you should do for me. If I'm seriously ill on the bottom left and cannot speak, move around, make my own decisions, one day, what you should do. Now, don't you think that is very important? Yes? Now, how many of us actually talk about that in, in advance? We don't. No, we, we don't. So by the time I, uh, you know, we, we have a heart attack or we, we are half, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, what do you call it, paralyzed or, 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 you know, get a stroke and, who is going to decide? How, how do we decide? How do, how do, in fact, I would argue that uh, seniors by seniors and juniors, when they don't communicate on a question like that, essentially not that it doesn't remove the burden of the juniors, but in fact, adds the burden of the junior, right? But delays it. So the, the junior may not feel so burdened now. I don't have to know so much. But when something happens, oops, now I'm outside the OT, the operating theater. I need to decide now, yes or no. The doctor is asking me. He or she needs to perform the procedure now. Now, now how, how burdensome is that? How heavy is that? A, a decision to make, right? So we, so uh, from a psycho, psychosocial or psychoeducation perspective, we, we often as psychologists say, look, if we can, don't postpone this. If we can move it earlier and do it in a, try to talk about this and make advanced decision, the advanced plan about this. Then when the time comes, Yes, it's still a burden. Yes, it may still be a painful decision or painful communication to make. But, but we know we, uh, at least one thing is that we're accurate. Uh, you know, if, as a caregiver, I'm accurately communicating what my senior uh, would communicate. I'm accurately conveying what my dad, mom would like. Right? That would be, I guess, if you talk about failure piety or respect for senior or respect for life, I guess that would be in, in line with those those values that, that, that some of us have. So, um, okay, so much for advanced care planning. Um, right, uh, what should I say to my loved ones? Setting the stage, right side. Uh, ACP conversation can take place anywhere. Your loved one might be more receptive when you approach them in a setting that's comfortable for them. Start with a familiar topic, you know, then move on to the ACP conversations, like that, uh, you know, and so familiar topics could be illness, religious teachings, books, newspaper articles, TV news, right? Third point, go slow and keep an open mind. Talking about your future care plans can be difficult. Uh, you realize your loved one may not agree with your decision, which is okay, right? So, um, um, this, okay, we should move on a bit more first. Remember on the left side, ACP is a lifelong journey, no right or wrong answers. You can always change your mind after you make your plans and it's ongoing. Right. Um, right. So this is by livingmatters.sg. You can, you can find this booklet called ACP or Advanced Care Plan, which I hope every caregiver uh, has access to, learns to use it and actually starts to use it. But if you think about it, if we are already in the habit of talking about such things, we don't need a guidebook like that, right? Look at this one on the, the, the right side, right? What should I say to my loved one? Is, look at those topics there and the guidelines there. One more time. Right. Do you think that these topics and those guidelines there actually apply even if there is no care involved? Could we talk about, is it possible to talk about these topics? Therefore, family member, hospitalization, religious teaching books, da, 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 right? Uh, keep an open mind, go slow. Is it, is it, is it, uh, is it in our routine, is, is it possible to take this approach with other aspects outside of care? 
I'd like you to think about that. Some of you may, you know, I see a few nods. Some of you perhaps think yes. Some of you are not sure, perhaps some of you are no, will say no. But think about it. Must we actually have, um, have, a, have a systematic guide on how to do in, uh, advanced care planning? Right. Um, in fact, uh, to what extent is this kind of conversation uh, a healthy or desirable everyday conversation with a senior at home? You can reflect on this in your, in your journals or in your projects, uh, in your advocacy project. All right. Okay, questions, anybody, before we move on back to the slides? Okay, stop share on this. Okay, move back to the slides. Okay. All right. Uh, share screen again. All right. Okay. Okay, we'll now quickly go into the um, healthcare uh, health services utilization. This is called the Anderson and Davidson model 2007. It is by far a, pre uh, a credible model, an established model to explain health outcomes and health behaviors um, of uh, people requiring long-term care. There are three parts to this. There are essentially um, three parts to each of those factors, predisposing, enabling, and need factors. Each of these three group of factors either happen in a context or are associated with an individual, usually a senior person. And then um, these together, both individual and contextual factors impact whether or not a person use day rehabilitation center or, or other forms of long-term care. And then the use or non-use obviously impacts the health, perceived health uh, and satisfaction in life or quality of life of the senior. That's the model. We say there are six categories of adverse outcomes due to family caregiving on the caregiver. Social demographic, things like just having less money, uh, you know, have a of, uh, uh, coming downwards or, or falling in social economic status because, you know, less, less, uh, more money is spent on the caregiving task. Uh, intensity and type of care, right? Uh, outcome could essentially be caregiving can be so intense that a person actually has to, uh, give up job or reduce work hours, right? Take half day off every other day, right? Or be, from full become part-time, right? Caregiver perception of care recipient suffering might be different as part of the caregiving journey, right? Caregiver may at first get very worried, first time caregiver, new caregiver, uh, new chronic illness or new uh, disability. But after some time, they think that that is normal, that is okay, right? They start to have what we call uh, some numbness or harden of heart. Right. Caregivers often, number four, forget about his or her own health. Um, you know, um, it's very common that caregivers go into burnout, depression, anxiety, uh, start to drink excessive alcohol, or even go into uh, drug, illicit drug use due to the stressors of uh, caregiving. Number five, caregivers' social and professional supports may be available, may partially available, may not be available. And uh, the supports may, may step back. So let's say... Uh, peer support. So caregiver while working, right, uh, has the benefit of colleagues and, you know, to kind of have social support, right? So if the caregiver now stop working or partially stops, become a from full to part-time, right, because the time is going to be spent on caring for the mother or the father, then you find that the caregiver's social network becomes smaller, right? And so then when the, when the caregiver now spend more time uh, engaging in caregiving tasks, feeling the intensity, feeling the heat of it. Now, who does, who could then this person talk to? Now I am more stressed. Last time when I go to the, uh, everyday work, I mean, nine to six, nine to five, I have a certain level of work stress. Now my stress is family caregiving. Who can I talk to now? It's just me and my mom. That's about it, right? Uh, so I'm gonna complain to my mom about her. No, I'm not gonna do that. Then who can I talk to? I don't have a colleague. Right, um, I may have a sibling, or that'll be great, or my husband or my wife. Right, so we're saying that the professional support may be less. So, talk think about people who fully resign from their jobs, day jobs, and take care of seniors at home. 
what kind of support and from whom do these caregivers get support? Number six, care recipients' physical home environment, right? Uh, that may change. Um, adverse outcomes to the care, perhaps to the care recipient or to the caregiver, depending. I mean, the installation of ramps, grab rails, grab poles, handrails, and so on may actually make the house more conducive for the senior person, but perhaps less conducive for the caregiver or other family members. Perhaps less convenient. Perhaps the, the house would have younger children or young children there. And that may or may not be having a wheelchair in the house may or may not be say safe, for instance. Um, now caregiving also will have public health outcomes. Um, right. I think I showed this earlier, but if I can ask you to focus on the red box, right? So once again, dementia only on the first column, no dementia fewer than two self care needs on the right box. The question is, did caregiving keep you from visiting in person with friends or family? That means the, the question is really asking the caregiver whether you have less time with your uh, friends or family due to caregiving, right? So you can see the marked difference between the first, sorry, between the, the last column and the second last, right? Those with dementia and two or more care needs, you see that 30.8% said yes. Due to caregiving, I have spent, I'm spending less time with my friends and family. Compared with the, uh, the rightmost column, 11.2% say yes, uh, among those uh, caring for no dementia and fewer than two self care needs. Very big difference. We did a, my colleagues and I did a systematic review and meta-analysis on the um, relationship or association between on the one hand, caregiver burden, caregiver depression and caregiver self-perceived health status. Uh, and on the other hand, use or non-use or intensity of use of any long-term care facility, whether it's dementia care or day rehabilitation or nursing home or home therapy, home medical and so on, right? We uh, surveyed or we, we could say we actually flipped through journal articles and dissertations from Medline, Site-Info, essentially these one, two, three main databases. And the key question was, is long-term care service use, LTCSU, related to or associated with the well-being, i.e. burden, depression, and health status of informal caregivers. Is there an association? If yes, then what is the strength? Right? Is it strong, weak? In what direction? Are they directly related or inversely related? That was the question we asked. Um, okay, this is the methodology. Essentially, there are two components to this research, the quantitative and the qualitative part. The quantitative part is called a meta-analysis. That means all the various... Uh, correlations or T statistic, F statistic, we kind of combine all of them into one combined statistics, right? we call the combined effect size. And then with that number, we, we could essentially say, right, is it a big or small or medium effect size? Is it positive or negative? For the qualitative side, essentially we tabled, uh, the, we tabled all the various study and participant characteristics. Study characteristic meaning in which country is it West, Western world or Eastern world? A participant characteristic would be things like gender, age group, um, yeah, social economic status. Okay, three main slides on what we found. The first thing, where residential care or nursing home care is concerned, informal caregivers who care for nursing home patients, right, actually felt less burden. What do we mean by that? Um, MA, right, there stands for meta-analysis or the quantitative uh, result, right? What we found was that among these 24 studies, right, studies that involve nursing homes reported 70% lower chances or lower likelihoods of caregivers experiencing greater burden. So it's almost like saying that once a caregiver or, 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 right, puts, uh, puts the, uh, or decides either collaboratively or independently to have his or her father or mother care recipient in a nursing home, right, about 70% of them feel less burden after the decision is made. The decision to institutionalize or to let the senior stay in a home called a nursing home. 
right? On the other hand, those that did not involve nursing homes, that means journal articles, uh, research studies that did not involve nursing home residents and caregivers, that means they only studied caregivers of daycare, home care, and so on, right? In fact, um, showed that the use of these various care facilities increased burden of the caregivers by about 39%, right? So it's almost like saying, right, essentially in layman terms, um, nursing home seems to uh, nursing home seems to reduce a lot of the care burden or the burden of care uh, from a big portion, right? In this case, in the study, we had 70% of the caregivers. So that was, that was burden. Now, how about depression? Is caregiver depression related to use of long-term care services? The answer is yes, right? On the right side, you see that right, among the studies, here there are 14 journal articles and or dissertations, right? Research studies, right, who, who studied this phenomenon, that means the association between the caregiver depression and use of long-term care services, right? We found this, that studies in which 70% of the participants, 70 or more, 70% 70 or more of the participants were female, caregivers reported 18% lower odds or lower likelihood of these caregivers having higher depression, right? So when we say lower odds of higher depression, that means they, they, the female caregivers tend to not feel as depressed compared to the males, right? Uh, when the care recipient uses long-term care services. So think about it. Is it, is it, does it, does it, um, does it surprise you? We know that uh, overall uh, women compared with men tend to have a higher prevalence uh, of uh, depression. Right? That, that is essentially the prevalence uh, statistics. But here we are saying, look, where use of long-term care is concerned, right? If, if this is a female caregiver, right? and his or her ward is uh, using long-term care, and she, she is uh, likely to feel less depressed. Next one. Now the question is whether there is a relationship or association between perceived health of the caregiver or caregiver health status and use of long-term care, any form of long-term care. What we found was that non-American studies had lower, 50% lower likelihood of caregivers experiencing worse health, worse self-perceived health related to the use of long-term care by their patients or by their care recipients, right? Um, that's kind of interesting. Um, Non-US studies, so we are saying Asian studies, Australian studies. Right. So whether the study, the research study came from Asia, like um, China, um, Taiwan, I remember we had, Korea, right? These are, and also Australia, New Zealand, these are non-US studies, right? When we, when we took out these studies, took out their effect sizes, whether T-test, F-test, whatever, put all of them together, calculate some kind of combined uh, statistic, we found that these, uh, in, in these places, these studies that arises from these places tell us that yes, the relationship between caregiver health and use of long-term care by the patient is that caregiver health uh, is seems to be better, not so not so much worse. Whereas U.S. studies, in the American studies, reported about twenty-five percent higher likelihood of caregivers experiencing worse self-perceived health, right? worse self-perceived health related to the use of long-term care by their loved ones or patients or care recipients. So what we are saying is look, there is a relationship between caregiving, whether it's caregiving burden, caregiving depression or caregiving uh, health status, what I call, what we call well-being, caregiver well-being. There's a relationship between well-being and use of long-term care services, right? Often uh, with the previous Anderson and Davidson model 2007, right? We say, look, whether a person use or not use long-term care, it essentially depends on their individual, that person. But today we now know that it is no longer true that 
long-term care decisions, whether to stay in nursing home or use day rehabilitation center or dementia care and so on, it's no longer true that this decision is made individually by the patient, by the care recipient, by the senior. We, are, we now say that, look, decisions are jointly made between the caregiver and the care recipient. Right? And whatever the decision is, whether use or don't use, use how much, when to use, when not to use, this decision necessarily impacts, necessarily is related to the informal caregiver's well-being in three regards, depression, health status, burden. Okay, I hope you understand that. Any questions? All okay? All right, can you just type on the chat to say, type yes if you are following, type yes, just type yes. Okay, I see many yeses. Okay, almost all yeses. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we are now, okay, we are doing okay on time, 5.15 now. We now move on to the cost and opportunity cost of informal care giving. All right, first of all, American statistics. What is the uh, caregiving cost? So how do we measure caregiving cost? Essentially, we are interested in the out-of-pocket cost. That means how much does a caregiver spend without subsidy, without subvention, without support from government or whatever agencies, how much does the caregiver spend, right? Just, just, just out of his or her pocket for the care recipient. That's what we call out of pocket costs or out of pocket caregiving costs, right? So what do we see here? Um, in the year 2017, financially, right, um, 470 billion USD was spent on this, on, on what we call unpaid caregiving. So these people are unremunerated. They spend money to buy this, that, 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 that for their loved ones. And aside from money, it's also time, 34 billion hours of care, right, involving how many? 41 million family caregivers in the US in 2017, right? So that's the quantum we're talking about. Okay, can we quantify emotion into some kind of cost? So let's say a person goes into depression, anxiety, have mood disorders, needs to see a doctor, pay for medication, pay for treatment. Right? Could we quantify that as costs? That's one of the assumptions here. So we found, uh, studies found that caregivers who institutionalize a relative with dementia had depression and anxiety levels as high as they were while they were in home care. This is interesting, right? In 2004, uh, this was found. That means uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Just now we said, right, um, that where caregiver burden is concerned, if you institutionalize your, your relative or loved ones, right, your burden kind of reduced, right? That's what we said earlier. But here we're saying, look, um, if a, this relative or this father or mother has dementia, then your depression or anxiety levels aren't going to change even if you put him in a facility, a staying facility. You want to think about why is that, right? Next one. Transition to institutionalized care is difficult for spouses, more so for wives than for husbands. Right? That is what, that is another finding uh, of, of the research. Thirdly, caregivers continue to show higher rates of depression. That means feel more depressed and anxious for as long as three years after bereavement, after the passing on of their loved ones. And finally, only bereaved family members whose loved ones receive home hospice services, right, um, uh, compared with nursing home and hospital, reported higher satisfaction and fewer unmet needs. So what this is saying is um, at end of life or for the patient, for the senior person, right? Compare, comparing nursing home and acute hospital and home hospice. If this older person pass on in a home hospice service, that means having nurse and having different uh, therapy aids in the house at different times of the day or a certain regularity, when it's only in this, um, among the, these three conditions or facilities, only in this home hospice service that caregivers uh, may find life more satisfying and feel less 
uh, and have less unmet needs. That means depression, anxiety, and so on. So home hospice does make does seem to make a difference to the end of life care and the bereavement of the caregiver, i.e., the the the, the well being of the caregiver. Okay, we go on to time and financial costs. On the left, table four, shows average care time provided and wages estimated for different caregiver groups. What does that mean? Um, so we have under 65 years, men and women, over 65 years, men and women, right? on the horizontal, on the vertical, we have average wage, salary per hour, and then the next vertical, average care time, hours per person per year. And then on the right most, total care time in terms of number of billions of hours per year. So I, I put in the boxes, those two numbers there, 22.33 and 30.06. What are they? 22.33 is the total care time or 22.33 billion hours. It's the total care time per year, right? Then it's spent on caring for, um, sorry, it's, they are spent by uh, caregivers under the age of 65, right? I say this again, 22.33 billion hours per year, right? Was spent by cumulatively caregivers who are under 65 years in caring for somebody the care recipient. 30.06 or 30 billion hours a year was spent by all caregivers. Right? So that is the, the quantum we're talking about in terms of total care time. Okay, table five, cost of informal caregiving in billions of dollars per year. Now, uh, once again, under 65 years caregivers, over 65 years, right? And then there, we see now this column called opportunity costs. So essentially the uh, authors, the researchers took into account the various things that they had to give up, like essentially work, right? So work supposed to bring in income. So if they have to give up the work in order to care, and if they reported this kind of um, trade-off, then the last drawn wage is being taken into account, opportunity costs. Then, then, of course, there are other things. Free time. Free time could be spent on, say, a certain luxury item or some kind of recreation, right? That, uh, and that people usually derive some enjoyment for that, although you have to pay financially for that. So now, um, the enjoyment, right, is quantified. Right? Of course, opportunity costs uh, also... Okay, sorry. I think that's about it. So, okay, I see a question from Phoebe. I, I'll come to you in a while. Um, so what we see here is a total of $412 billion per year was, right, is, is the opportunity cost or is the alternative of what could have been spent, right? If, if these men and women under 65 didn't care for somebody, they could have, they, they, they could have uh, another a total of four, 412 billion to, to spend on, I mean, cumulative. Right? The final row that under all, right, for all caregivers, whether you're under or over 65, right, the opportunity cost of caring is 522 billion per year. Um, this research even gone into gone further into what we call skilled and unskilled care. So in the states, um, um, they, they they try to compare uh, this caregiver to a certain uh, level. So so if a certain caregiver has undergone certain training. Right, and pass certain levels of training, then he or she is considered a skilled caregiver. Although I'm informal at home, not you know, not 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 fully paid, but you have some skills. Right. Then there will be others who undergone have undergone not no training on insufficient training. Right? Then the person is considered unskilled caregiver. So skilled caregivers give up more because those skills that they pick up, right, in order to care for their loved ones at home. Um, often could be used in some other um, facility, right? Think about it. Could a skilled caregiver who say is very good at uh, using the wheelchair, many, bringing a person up and down a step, could he or she be a therapeutic nurse, therapeutic aid? That's what we're talking about, right? Caregivers, for instance, could be trained, home caregivers, i.e. family members, could be trained to um, 
to uh, change adult diapers anywhere, from changing adult diapers to uh, manipulating uh, nasogenic feeding tubes. Perhaps could even be taught how to do nursing procedures, like caring for a wound. In fact, they are doing it right now. And I'm not sure whether uh, we would even move into what we call uh, drawing blood or taking blood intravenously, doing IV. Right? So these are all nursing skills, right? If you train a caregiver, like we train a nurse, but of course not for a whole spectrum of nursing jobs, uh, nursing, nursing tasks, but on specifics that the care recipient requires so that he or she, the caregiver at home, could actually do what a nurse does right, to a certain acceptable level of proficiency and safety, right? doesn't that make the person a skilled nursing aide, so to speak? And if the answer is yes, then shouldn't he or she be paid a certain wage? If he or she isn't paid that wage, right, that a, a nursing aide is paid for his or her skill, then there will be opportunity costs. That's what this piece of research is saying. Right, so we, for skill care, we really see, we really see a, a, a very high opportunity costs, which, well, partially perhaps explain why informal caregivers may not uh, want to get trained, may not think it might be necessary to get trained. Okay, uh, Phoebe has a question. Hi, Wayne, does transition to institutionalized care for spouses mean wives putting husband in homes or wives going into homes? Oh, um, transition... Uh, it, it could be it could be either way. So wife putting husband in homes or husband putting wife in homes. Essentially, uh, when, we, when we say home to hospice or home to nursing home, so that's what it means. It, it doesn't matter whether it's... Yeah. Um, I don't know if I answer your question. Um, because my question was from the point in the previous slide where you said that uh, women are more than men. Like, do you mean that it's more difficult for women to be in nursing homes or more difficult for women to put their husbands in nursing homes? Right. Uh, okay, thank you for the question. Transition to institutionalized care is difficult for the spouses of the care recipient. So, right, so the, the answer is, it is uh, women find it difficult to put their husbands in the nursing homes. Oh, so what, what does it mean by difficult? There are many things there. The, trans, the, the moving, like moving, so the initial moving, to not being, stay, not, not being able to stay together, not being able to sleep together, not being able to share their day-to-day -day lives together. Right. Uh, right. Women find that quite, uh, I mean, compared with men who put their wives in the nursing home, these women who put their husbands in the nursing home find that a great challenge. I hope I answered that question. Uh, Ting Yu has a question. I feel doesn't have to be putting them permanently in homes. Hospice in nursing homes is also possible. Could you explain uh, or elaborate a little bit? What do you mean by hospice in nursing homes? Ting Yu, if you are here. Ting Yu, no? Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure I got Ting Yu, uh, but yes. Uh, uh, none of these facilities have to be a permanent facility for the care recipient. That's right. Whether it's hospice or nursing home or, yep, yeah, right. Um, it doesn't have to be permanent. Uh, in fact, the patient or the care recipient do, do have uh, do, uh, 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 perfectly, uh, what they call that, and empowered to say, look, I'm done with this nursing home, even though, yeah, blah, 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 I want to go home now. Yeah, sure. Uh, the home usually respects the wishes. Um, but I'm not sure what you mean by hospice in nursing home because hospice is one facility, nursing home is one facility. I'm not sure what you mean. You mean having hospice facility in nursing home? No, that's possible. That means end of life equipment, palliative care uh, equipment and procedures and nurses uh, and professionals in uh, what we call a physical nursing home setting. Yes, 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 that's, that's possible. Yeah. Jingyu, are you there? I hope you answered, I answered you. Okay, right, all good. Can I move on? All right, okay. Um, where are we? Uh, opportunity cost. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I've just essentially said these slides, uh, said these points right in red in the previous slide. Uh, findings, basically just pay attention to the third point there on findings. Um, Right, total opportunity cost, 522 uh, per annum, 412 per annum. If we exclude caregivers above 65, then unskilled cost, skilled replacement cost. 
right? Think about the policy implications. If you are, uh, you know, if you're gonna do something about uh, managing costs, whether opportunity costs or financial costs or any other costs uh, in your project, then you want to think about what are the policy implications of 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 this cost. For instance, could it be that, um, could it be that money is more well spent, as in public money is more well spent if we pay for this? Because these people then don't have to do our pocket. And when we pay for this, we can have economies of scale, perhaps. That's just a suggestion for you to think about. And of course, you need to read up more to say you know, whether or not it makes sense in, uh, in the local context. Okay. All right, Tingyi, I saw your response. All right. Okay. Family caregiving will become more expensive, right? Um, in 2013, it was the foregone earnings, right? 67 billion. Right? The projection is 132 to 147 billion by 2050, the US. Okay, because there will be just more and more seniors who will be uh, suffering from one or more disabilities. And because, well, we say that when caregivers uh, become more educated, I mean, adults are generally becoming more and more educated, same thing in Singapore. So we tend to believe that uh, these adults will fetch uh, more higher wages, right, over time, right? So then if you have a more, old, more older people and more adults who, who will get higher wages over time, then it's like these adults who will become caregivers later uh, will have to forego these higher wages, right? So caregiving costs will become more expensive. Um, right, once again, what are the policy implications of that? Right, are we going to tell right, uh, caregivers uh, to not get so high education? <laughs> no, right, doesn't make sense. Are we gonna say, look, if you have high education to a certain level, no, 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 you, you shouldn't be a caregiver. That's a waste of your time. That's a waste of the investment, you know, the, uh, the education ministry have for you or on you, right? We should reserve caregiving to a select group. So we should have professionally trained informal caregivers. Should we do that? What are the pros and cons of that? Right? Should every family have his or her own informal caregiver? Or should we have a body that essentially professionalizes and does professional informal caregiving? This is something that is difficult to answer. Work-related uh, opportunity costs. Uh, estimated opportunity costs in the red box right, is 67 billion, right, work-related. Um, this is 2013, uh, estimated work-related opportunity cost of unpaid caregiving, right? So 67 billion um, dollars, US dollars, right? Um, <clears throat> per caregiver, if you divide that, works out to um, 5,000, now this is no longer in billion, 5,251 dollars uh, per caregiver, go by per care recipient or go by per US resident, those are the amounts there right, in terms of opportunity cost, money that could have been spent elsewhere. All right, very quickly. Um, in Europe, um, a study by, uh, I cannot pronounce this, this author's name. Essentially this study found that, um, well, 12 countries I should say was, were studied right, in this study. And this study found that poor health or poor caregiver health is, was usually associated with living with a family-based care, living in a family-based care country. That means a country, right? In Europe, there are several, many countries, right? In countries where the family is assumed or is tasked to be like the main custodian, or the main uh, caregiving unit, Right. Family first, if you really cannot care, then the state will, will care for you. Then the state will pay for your care. In those situations, we see caregivers reporting poor health. That's what it says. Second point there, right? With an increased extent, that means hours in terms of time, right? And intensity, right? But this, I guess, is uh, quite straightforward, intuitive. You have to spend more time caring, more intense caregiving, caregivers report poor health. Next, second point, non-financial support measures seem to have a larger protective impact on the health of caregivers. So um, we often think, look, uh, we talked so much about work-related costs and financial costs and opportunity costs, right? And even emotional costs, right? In dollar terms, right? But in this study, right, of 12 European countries, it was found that support given that is non-financial in nature, 
actually do help or improve the health of caregivers as compared to financial support, regardless of the gender or sex of the caregiver, whether it's male or female. Third point, currently available policies of support associated with better caregiver health are those that, number one, provide them, provide these caregivers with free time, some free time. Number two, help these caregivers deal with the emotions associated with caregiving. And three, empower these caregivers with skills, right? To improve the care situation, right? These are policies according to the authors, right? In among those 12 European countries that seem to um, seem to come together with better caregiver health. Right, in OECD countries, there's, there's another group of countries, right? Essentially, there are four features, right? Um, in terms of caregiving policy. In OECD countries, we find that a caregiver or a carer has a statutory role. What does that mean? That means you are designated a caregiver by the country, by the, by the government, by the state. Right. Your name is on a, a registry, right? Yeah. How that, how your name goes into that is another story, right? Often it is the care recipient or the patient, right, nominating you, but there could be other ways too. So of course, then that calls into question of um, uh, the the rightness or wrongness or the legality, uh, and whether people would uh, free write the system, you know, putting them their own names onto this, you know, this register of caregivers, so to speak. Why formalize? Because once a person is on that list called you're a statutorily recognized caregiver, you're given benefits. Yeah, you're given support. Next, um, in these countries, OECD, uh, we see combi a combined uh, caring, I mean, a combined um, care and work. So paid work, you could leave your work, you can take leave from work to give care. You could also have a flexible work schedule. And you don't have to quit your job. Your employer is also not supposed to uh, fire you due to caregiving. Next, improved or uh, uh, these policies team uh, in OECD countries also focus on improving carers' physical and mental well-being. So um, these policies do not just give money, but they provide respite care. That means what we call temporarily temporary care for the care recipient. So the caregiver, the home or family caregiver could take a rest, you know. Um, so what does that mean? That might literally mean that the, um, the state provide a 24 hour stay home person with, uh, to take care of the care recipient needs for a short period of say two weeks or three weeks. That's respite care, right? Counseling and training for caregivers, right? Counseling the emotional, psychological, social aspects of the well-being, training also in the physical and mental, uh, how, how to self-care, how to self-care, uh, teach the caregivers how to care for their own physical needs and mental needs. And then of course, providing information and coordination. And then finally, compensate and recognize caregivers or carers, right? In many of these OECD countries, we find that caregivers are given an allowance, right? How, how to calculate that allowance, how to calibrate the quantum is, Right, it's something that's arguable or debatable, but they're given allowance so that their out of pocket uh, uh, cost or out of pocket spending or expenditure is not so high. How do we calibrate that? Do we, for instance, calibrate that to the severity of the illness of the care recipient? Do we calibrate that to say the last drawn income of the caregiver? How do we, or do we weigh both of these, give a certain percentage to A and certain percentage to B? Right, um, it's something uh, that is. Uh, that is uh, that, that, that requires time to study, that requires study. And uh, cash benefits for the care recipient. So in many of these OECD countries, um, the care recipient is given, say, a pool of money. And then this care recipient can use this money to pay for his or her own informal care. So this informal caregiver may be, say, uh, um, a family member, or it may not be, but this care recipient actually has, right, has the power to decide because he or she has the money. So aside from all the state-sponsored, uh, what we call facilities and services, right, cash is given to care recipient to specifically pay for informal care. 
question for us is, does it work in Singapore? Can we imagine uh, our seniors at home being given a pool of, say, $500 a month, I don't know, or a few hundred dollars a month and say, look, that's the money you have, or $1,000 a month, and then say, look, uh, you, you can spend this money on however you want on caring for yourself, informal care, but if you don't spend it, then uh, the, the, the money will not roll over. Next month, we'll start the kitty again from, from, from 1000 or 500 Do we want to do that? Um, what are the cons, pros and cons? Okay, I see, uh, Rachel, you have a question? I see you raise your hand. No? Okay, all right, sure. All right. Uh, okay, finally, this one. Um, this is, I think, my, is it my final slide? It could well be my final slide um, on the Singapore. Yep, it's my final slide. Um, what kind of informal caregiving policy do we have in Singapore? On the left, we have an act called the Maintenance of Parents Act. Right? If you do not maintain your parents, right, your parents could report on you and, well, in the state would mandate you to Will, will mandate you uh, to, to, to care for him and spend a certain amount of money per month. On top of that, you have to pay a penalty to the state. So that we have the act. So that is like a safety net to protect, right? You can say that is one type, uh, one, one, one kind of policy or one policy, the, the act. So parents are at least at the very bottom at the very uh, lowest level safeguard, older parents. Then we have from um, the year 2014, in fact, 2015, this thing called the sharing of parent relief. That means um, parent, this parent relief or handicap parent relief is given to promote filial piety and recognize individuals who are supporting their parents, grandparents, parents-in-law or grandparents-in-law in Singapore. You may claim this relief for up to two dependents. When you claim this relief on both your parents, then you will not be able to claim the relief on your parents-in-law. If more than one individual is maintaining the same dependent and meets the qualifying condition of this relief, then this parent relief can be shared between the claimants on an agreed proportion or apportionment. Right? Um, so this, is, this happens when we have to pay taxes. So the IRAS, the Inland Revenue Authority, will come to you every year when you start working ask you to, okay, it's time to pay taxes, submit your income for the last year, submit your, you don't have to submit your pay slip, but your employer will give you some right, document to say the entire year, that's how much you earn, right? So based on that, they'll calculate, right, this is how much tax you should pay due to your income earned last year. Now you can say, look, I uh, have uh, one aged parent at home, or I have one uh, handicapped parents or two at home, right? And then if you say that, you declare his name, put in the IC number, then, okay, uh, out of this, amount uh, of tax that you are required to pay, we will remove this. That's what uh, it is. So we could possibly say that, yeah, this is another uh, another mode or another form of caregiver you know, act, uh, policy. Uh, but of course, we could also argue that this is not. You know? Third one, now this is where, this is the current or the newest one on the right side, caregiver support plan. This is put up by the Ministry of Health, supported by the Agency for Integrated Care. Right. Um, essentially, there are five prongs there. You can see care navigation, financial support, caregiver empowerment and training, caregiver respite services, and workplace support. Right. Um, so far, among the various caregiving plans, it seems to be the most comprehensive yet. Announced in early 2019, came into effect in the later half of 2019. Um, um, one of the features is called a home caregiving grant, where each um, care, in fact, it is now upgraded, but at that point, each care uh, giver is given $200 to spend on any aspects of caregiving, anything, essentially, that is on caregiving per month. Sorry, is it per month? Um, no, I beg your pardon. It's uh, uh, not business. It is, I think it's. Uh, let me see if it's per month. Yes, it's per month. That's right. $200 per month. Right. That has now uh, increased. Um, okay, I think that's 
all the slides I have, right? Any more slides? Nope, that's all the slides I have. Um, okay, I want to uh, give some time to, okay.